Hello, my name's Mark, I'm G-Code Tutor. Now I'm here with Practical Machinist today to carry on on the second video of this series where we're going to program this part complete with G-Code on a CNC lathe. So if you saw the previous video, you know that we took a look at our part and we decided what tools we're going to use and what order of operations we're going to use to be able to write the code for this. So this lesson is all about laying out the header. So let's pop our drawing over to the side so we can write some G code. So I always start off my header with the program number and then the part number. So our 0200 here is our program number. Now note that that first number there is actually a letter O and not a number zero. And then in operator's notes, we're gonna pop in the part number and we're gonna finish with an end of block, which is that semicolon there. Now everything in brackets is not read by the machine. So all these things that's in brackets right now, this is purely to remind the operator and to let the operator know what's going on. Now, when we're writing headers, there is many ways to do it and there is not a single correct way. Now, a lot of you would be using setup sheets in your setups and in your programs, and that's great. We can have more information in the setup sheets, it talks about the tooling, etc. But maybe you're in a small shop um, and they don't use setup sheets, then I would put all of the information in the header. Now, a lot of this information I would also include in the header, even if you're using setup sheets. It helps with the latest revision to make sure it's the same version everyone's working on. And it's great for a quick glance at the tooling to see how to set this part up. So the next line here, I normally have a note about who programmed this. In this case, it's me. So if there's any confusion later on, the operator knows who to go to to ask questions about why or how something was done within this program. After that, I add the date and the version number. So by adding the date, then we know what version we're on. We can see the last time this program was edited, when it was written, etc. So normally I would add the date that it was originally written. And then for version control, I would add the date of the latest update afterwards. That way, if we have more than one program for the same thing, we can quite quickly and easily see which version is the latest. We also need to note what machine this is going on. All machines can be slightly different, certainly the way it handles datums maybe, or the way certain G codes work or M codes. Each machine can sometimes have its own features that's been added by the machine manufacturer. So it's always worth adding what machine this program was originally written for. And then if it's been attempted to run on the wrong machine, the operator knows he needs to take extra care during the tape tryout, just in case anything is not the same. Next, I add what material we're using. So I'm using 6082 aluminium for this and two and an eighth inch bar. Our major diameter is two inches. So we're gonna need some bar that's slightly bigger than that. So we can produce an accurate large diameter there. If we're using two inch bar, you may find it doesn't clean up enough. So I would avoid using bar size, the same size as our part, unless it's only a rough diameter and not dimensionally important. Now I use these end of blocks to break up sections of program. Now I find it's much easier to read by doing this. And it also tells the operator that that, likes, that section is over. And now the next section is important and it's not connected. So we've got our initial program header there. Now a lot of people might just leave the header like that and then start writing the program. But I like to add a lot more information here just to make sure there is no mistakes when we come to setting up no confusion. So the next section is tooling. So I have that in its own section there. I'm just saying this is what tools we're going to be using. And this section of the header is all about tooling. So on this line are N1T0101. So when programming G-code, we used to use N numbers on every single line. In fact, the machines used to put them there automatically for us. In this day and age, we don't tend to program like that anymore. Maybe you might on a very old machine, but these N numbers can also be used as a search number. So instead of having N100, N200, etc., for every single line, by just simply labeling each section of our program N1 or N2, then we have a very quick way to search through the program to get to that section. So if we type N1 on our FANUC controls, push the down arrow, it will search through to the section of the program where it sees N1. So I tend to use these N numbers these days as a search function and an easy way to skip through the program to get to the section I need to see. 
the T0101 is our tool one, datum table position one or offsets one. So this tells me that tool one and offset one is going to be used for our roughing tool. Now, as we go through the program, we'll do tool calls by using T0101, etc., and that ties in to the information in the header here. Now, if we're not using setup sheets, I would add all the information right here about what grade of tip we are using and what tool holder. So the next line right under the roughing tool, I'm saying what tip we are gonna be using and what tool holder. Now the reason I do this is because sometimes I've picked up a program, put up a right hand knife tool, started cutting and I can't hold the dimensions. Something is not quite right and the dimensions are not coming out perfectly the same each time. Now, when I've spoken to the person that programmed it, he was like, oh, I had the same problem. I had to use a certain grade of tip or it was a different tool holder and it can cause a lot of confusions and it can cause a long setup times and a lot of problem solving. So by having the correct tip and tool holder listed underneath the operation right here, we know exactly what the initial program had done and how he went about it. That way there's no surprises if we're using the wrong grade of tip and we can't hit those dimensions or those surface finishes like the program was originally made for. So coming down now to our next tool, we're gonna to do our finishing tool. Now we discussed the orders of these tools in the previous video, so we know what order we're going to be machining this in. So here we're just listing the tools. Now I'm not going to list the tip and tool holder for each tool this time. I've demonstrated it once. Now we're just gonna go through each tool so we know what order we're going to be doing them. So here we have the finishing turn, then next up, the groove tool. And I've got the width of the groove tool there also, because if we're machining those grooves and we're using a, a tool that's slightly different size, we're gonna end up with different size grooves. So it's really important to add the size of the tool, especially for something like a groove tool. When it comes to doing the screw thread, we would also have a lot of data here about what tip we are using. Because again, if we're using carbide thread turning tips, there is radiuses on the crest and on the bottom of those teeth there, on those screw threads. So we need to know all that information, make sure it's correct, and it's within the British Standard Whitworth spec. So any information with our screw cutting tools, we can pop here also. And the next tool of operation would be our center drill. I'll probably use a number two center drill for this. So I've made a note in the header here. And excuse my English spelling of the word center. So this next tool here is our long series carbide drill. So we're gonna be using a quarter of an inch drill. And because the length is eight times the diameter, that means it's gonna be a deep hole drill. So we're gonna to need to consider how we're going to machine that. Where we're cutting aluminum, there's a good chance it's gonna bind up, it's gonna melt on that tip of the tool. So I would recommend for this, I would like to use a carbide tool and with through spindle coolant to keep that cutting edge nice and cool. Now, with carbide, there is less flex in the tools. If we're using HSS, they tend to flex a little bit before they shatter. With carbide, less flex, more chance of shatter, more chance of breaking. So bear that in mind. If you're finding the carbide drill keeps binding up and breaking on you, it might be best to try a high-speed steel one. Carbide is not always better, um, although it's harder and we can go faster with slightly higher speeds and feeds with carbide, but sometimes it might not be the right tool for the job. So bear in mind that HSS does have more flex than carbide. So we might find HSS might be a better way to cut this. So once we've parted off our component from the stock bar, we're then going to reverse it around and hold on that two inch diameter. Now we've got 0.364 to hold onto there, plus a little bit sticking out so we can clean up that face. So we should be able to hold that pretty square on that diameter there. And we can check that's running true by running a DTI on that bore or on the outer surface there of that part where it's in the collet, just to make sure everything's running true because we don't want any uh, part to be wiggling around in that collet chuck there. It's gonna cause us all sorts of concentricity issues. Now, once we've uh, faced off our back end there, we're going to come in with a U-drill. Now, this large section here, this 0.787 diameter, we can come in with a U-drill because we don't need to use center drills and we can also offset it to rough bore too. And I'll be showing you how to do that when we get to that stage. And then we've also got that chamfer on the front there. So I'm gonna come in with a half inch boring bar. We're going to finish off that diameter, that 787 diameter, 
and add that chamfer there so it's nice and accurate with a good surface finish. And for that, I'm going to be using a boring bar rather than finishing with the U-drill. Now here's another one of my ender blocks where I change the section. So now we've got a nice little gap. So the tooling section is all in its own place. And we can see the thing that happens from now on is not part of the tooling because I've used the ender block there to break things up. So now we can also put in the start pullout length. So this is the distance between your collet chuck and the end of the bar before we face it. So we just use a ruler normally to measure this on the first time. And then maybe in the program, we can pull out the bar using a bar feeder, et cetera, to the correct distance each time. But for the initial run, we're going to need to measure that with a ruler to pull that out from the collet chuck. Now we can also add other things here like our datum positions, our G54, G55, etc. G53 is usually the machine datum and we'll talk about that in the next lesson. But we can also add our datum positions here too, so we know our positions for our work shift datum. So that's how I lay out my header. Now a lot of people would put less information in here if you're using setup sheets. And Keeping the setup sheets and the header information the same in each version is also important. So it's always wise to have the same version control on the setup sheets and in the header as well. Now, personally, I like to add all of this information into the header, even if I'm using setup sheets. It stops mistakes and you can have the first page of the program on your machine as you're setting up. So you can quickly at a glance, check over to the screen to make sure you know what tool is next, what position it's going in in the turret, etc. So I like to add the same information here that's on the setup sheets. And you can even run this part without setup sheets if needed, because all your information is right there in the header. So if you want to know more about G-Code programming, I have a four course bundle over on my website at gcodetutor.com where I teach programming from beginner level up to advanced macro programming all in one mega bundle of courses. So if you're interested in that and you want to know more about G-Code programming or CAD CAM or Machine Shop Maths, pop over to my website at gcodetutor.com.